us in your arms tonight, God. Hallelujah, Lord, let us see the glory of the Lord, oh God. Oh, let there be rivers of living water that springs forth, God. For out of our belly shall flow rivers of living water, God. Oh, Lord. Hallelujah. Let us overflow in your anointing, God. Let my cup overflow, oh, God. Oh, I need a renewing, God. I need a refreshing, oh, God. I need your power. I need your glory, Jesus. Oh, just worship him tonight. Just give him your heart tonight. Here I am, oh, God. If you can use anything, Lord, you you can use me, God. Take my hands and take my feet, oh God. Hallelujah. Oh, we worship you, God. We love you tonight, God. Have your way in this place, God. Take us deeper, God. As deep call us into deep, Jesus. As the deer that panted for the water, God, our souls pant for you tonight, God. Oh, just worship. Yes, hallelujah, Jesus. Lord, we come before you tonight, God. Lord, humbled in your presence, Jesus. God, that your name is powerful, Lord. God, that you would love us, Jesus, despite everything, God, that we've done, Lord. You are so good, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, church, let's worship him tonight. What a 
church on a Thursday night. Amen. Hallelujah. Good to see all of you in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. If you're watching online, we're thankful that you're watching online, but we want to invite you to come and be here in person. Amen. Praise God. Let the Spirit of the Lord touch us. Amen. Praise God. Just a couple of announcements, and then we're going to give you a chance to give to the Lord tonight. Amen. We want to remember that All Nations Sunday is coming up. All Nations Sunday, Sunday, October the 18th. There it is on the screen. Amen. Praise God. Invite your co-workers, your friends, amen, to come and experience the God of every nation. Amen. The God of all creation. We're going to come and bless his name. Amen. Praise God. We will have food afterwards. Amen. So I'm uh, going to have a special song from the children's ministry. Amen. Our chorale that we're recently forming is going to sing. There's going to be prayer for all the nations. There's going to be a parade of nations. Amen. And then food and fellowship after service. So you mark your calendar. You don't want to miss that. That's just one week from this Sunday. Amen. Amen. So mark your calendar and come. The children's ministry, brother and sister Rouse, would like to just advise everybody about the Friday, October the 30th, our fall family hoopla. Amen. Looking forward to a great time of just having fun in the Lord. Praise God. Amen. And so they're asking all of you to bring some candy and donate it. Amen. For the kids. Amen. And uh, you can come and drop that off anytime or put it in the kitchen or give it to Brother or Sister Rouse or Sister Allie. Amen. Amen. He says there's going to be hot dogs and chips for them to eat at the event. Amen. And uh, they're asking for all the kids want to dress up. And so we don't want to celebrate witches and demons and devils. But if your child wants to dress up as a fairy tale character, we're saying 
that would be all right. Amen. Give them a chance to dress up and come. Amen. And I think there's going to be a prize or a contest for the characters. Amen. And if you need more information, feel free to contact Brother and Sister Ralph. Amen. To God be the glory. Friend Day coming up in November. Amen. We want to begin to invite our friends to the house of God. Amen. So you'll be hearing more about that after All Nations Sunday is over. Amen. Looking forward to a great time in the Lord. Want to remind you we're having prayer here at the church on Tuesday nights at 7. We're also Zooming. Brother Little was Zooming at 8 o'clock. Amen. And also he's having Zoom prayer on a daily basis. So be involved in prayer. Prayer changes things. Amen. Thank God. Amen. For three that got baptized on Sunday. Amen. And I was told one got the Holy Ghost. I'm not sure she had it or didn't have it, but she's got it now. Praise God. So we give God the glory for that. Amen. God is awesome and doing a great work. And I've just found out we're going to baptize two more this Sunday. Praise God. So God is at work. To God be the glory. Amen. Praise God. Let's bow our heads and pray over the offering. Then they're going to sing a song and you can come and give to the Lord tonight. Father, we just want to thank you tonight for your many blessings. Thank you for these that have given their hearts to you, that you have washed away their sins, never to be remembered against them again. I pray meet every need that's represented, God. You are able to do exceeding and abundantly above all that we think or ask. And we just ask your blessings upon this offering and bless our church tonight. We pray in Jesus' name and everybody say amen. Amen. Come and give to the Lord as they sing this next song. Amen.
And his name is, his name is, his name is Jesus. Jesus, praise God, praise God. God is good. As Pastor said, it is so good to be back in church on Thursday night. They're gone. And uh, the last, uh, what, two or three months, we've been teaching from church on Thursday nights, but we've been teaching to an empty auditorium, hoping and praying that somebody was online watching. And some of you were online watching, and we appreciate that. But we're back in the house of God. The Bible admonishes us, forsake not the assembly of yourselves together. This is the will of God. This is the will of God for you, that we assemble ourselves together with people of like precious faith. It is God's will that we get together. And when we don't obey the will of God, what is that called? Sin sin so we need to come back to church we need to come back to church amen amen find a way find a way find a way to be in the house of God with your brothers and sisters who love God just like you love God and appreciate all that he's doing in them and through them just like you appreciate what's God what God is doing in you and through you. Amen. God is good. God is good. God is good. All the time. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, I'm not going to keep you standing. You can sit down. I'm going to read a scripture here or two in the next couple of, uh, next couple of hours. So uh, buckle your seatbelt and get ready. But uh, I do want to, just want to thank pastor for giving me an opportunity to be up here it's a privilege and an honor and an awesome responsibility to be up here to teach the people of God the word of God it's not not something you ever do lightly it's not something that you ever want to do without preparation and prayer because what I say tonight is held against me on the on the day of judgment that I have communicated it to you. I want to make sure that what's said tonight is the Word of God and nothing but the Word of God. Amen. Praise God. We have been teaching over the last several weeks the fundamental doctrines of our faith. And my question several weeks ago was, what do you believe and why do you believe it? Because if you don't know why you believe what you believe, why do you believe it? If you can't prove it in some way or shape or form, why do you live by it? Why do you believe it? And if it's not in the Word of God, you shouldn't be believing it. And so the Word of God is our roadmap. You know, when my son was born, they put him into my arms, and I the first words out of my mouth is was, what do I do now? holding this little baby and the first thing, the only thing I can think of is, what do I do now? Well, this is the road map. This is God's word to humanity. This is the way, the truth and the life. This is how we're supposed to learn about God. And so we want to know what the Bible says about the fundamental doctrines of the Bible. And don't be afraid of the word doctrine. It just means truth. It just means teaching. That's all it means is teaching, all right? We want to know what the fundamental teaching of the Word of God says. And if it's not in the Word of God, I want to toss it. I don't care who's teaching it. I don't care uh, uh, whether my mom and dad believe it. I don't care if Annie and Uncle believed it. It doesn't make any difference. If it's not in the Word of God, it needs to go. And I need to find out what the Word of God says. Because this is the infallible Word. This is the infallible word. So we talked about that. We talked about the infallible word. We talked about the steps of salvation, repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name, being filled with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. So those are the steps 
that get you into a saved, a saved experience. Those are not the only steps you have to take to make it to heaven. There's a lot more you have to do to make it to heaven. But that gets you into the race, if you will. That qualifies you to get up to the starting line so that you can now run the race. And each one of us that has gone through those three steps are now running the race. Now we have to find out what we do while we're in the race. And then last week, Sister Overton taught such a wonderful lesson on holiness. Holiness is not something that happens to us overnight. Holiness is not something that just, you know, you get the Holy Ghost and now you are holy. And you can, okay, that's done. Now what's the next thing? No, no. Holiness is a progressive work in your life. Every day you've got to work on holiness. And God said, be ye holy, for I am holy. And so we need to be holy every day day. We need to strive for that holy existence every single day. And so today we're going to talk about divine healing. I'm going to open this water. Amen. Praise God. Has anybody ever been healed? Has anybody ever been healed by God? Has anybody ever had a divine healing experience? Amen. A lot of hands. A lot of hands up. Well, that's good. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. This is a fundamental doctrine or teaching of the Bible. And we want to find out what the Bible says about divine healing. Now, before I get started, I want to say this. All of these lessons that we've been teaching, we're just scratching the surface on what the Bible says about these subjects. We're not even getting into detail. We're just, we're just like, you know, touching the surface. And the Bible has so much more to say on each and every one of these subjects that there's no way we could cover it all in one hour lesson or even a, 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 a five hour lessons. Okay? So uh, just because we teach this and, and it doesn't uh, cover your situation, don't worry about it. God's got it covered in his word. It's just that we haven't covered it tonight or in any of the other lessons, okay? So I, the, the Bible says we're supposed to do what? Go ahead and say it. Study to show ourselves approved unto the pastor, right? Study to show ourselves approved unto our spouse, right? Study to show ourselves approved that we can prove that we're worthy of salvation, right? No, we are to study to show ourselves approved unto unto God, unto God. My job as a saint of God, one of my jobs as a saint of God is to study his word. And just because I'm up here teaching doesn't mean that I'm special. Every saint of God has the same commandment levied on him or her to study the word of God. Because if I say something up here that's wrong, it's your responsibility to go back in the word and study it and say, hey, wait a minute, something's wrong there. Something's wrong there. All right? So it's your job to study the Word of God, to take what is preached or taught from this pulpit and make sure it's in the Word. Amen. Amen. So we're talking about divine healing tonight. So first point I want to make is divine healing is a promise from God. Divine healing is a promise from God. Divine healing is talked about both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And it's amazing to me how closely the scriptures relating to salvation and to healing are to each other. I just want to plant that seed, all right? So when the children of Israel left Egypt and they ran up against the Red Sea, they were following God and they ran up against the Red Sea and God opened the Red Sea and they walked across the Red Sea on dry ground and God closed the 
Red Sea on all of the Egyptians, and he killed all the Egyptian army. The next place that the Israelites went to, the first stopping place that the Bible tells us about was a place called Moriah. And at Moriah, they found water. Now, when you're in the desert, there's one thing that you've got to find every single day. What is it? Water. And what kind of water does it have to be? Drinkable. you got to be able to drink it. If you find water that you can't drink, you haven't found water. And so they come to Moriah, and they arrive at this place that has water, but it's bitter, and they can't drink it. And so the people moan and complain to Moses. Moses goes to God. God shows Moses a, a, uh, a tree. Moses throws the tree into the water, and the waters become sweet. All right? So this is the first encounter with trouble outside of the land of Egypt, outside crossing the Red Sea, being liberated, if you will, from the Egyptians. This is the first, first time they run into trouble. And so this is what God says to Moses in Exodus chapter 25, verses 25, excuse me, Exodus 15, 25 and 26. And he cried unto the Lord, this is Moses crying unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree which when he had cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet, that he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. So the next verse is the statute and the ordinance that God made with the people of Israel after he made the water sweet. This is the statute and the ordinance. And he said, this is God talking, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all of his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. God introduced himself as the Lord that heals them. This is the first statute. This is before the law of Moses. This is the first ordinance that God makes with the children of Israel after they leave Egypt. I'm going to heal you. So if I could say it this way, after salvation, the first thing God does after he saves them out of Egypt is he tells them that there is divine healing available to them. They have divine healing available to them. This is a statute and this is an ordinance. But listen, this is there to prove them. What does that mean? Well, God gave conditions on how they had to live their lives if they wanted to be healed. The conditions were that if thou diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord and will do that which is right in his sight and will give ear to his commandments... And will keep all of his statutes. Those are the conditions that they had to meet to do to get divine healing. There were no statutes at this point, right? Because they hadn't been to Mount Sinai yet. There was no law. So before the law, God gave the command that if you follow the law, which you're going to get, there's going to be divine healing available to you. So, salvation and healing. Psalms chapter 103, verses 1 through 3 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, and who healeth all thy diseases. Praise God. David says he's going to forgive your sins. What's that sound like? Salvation. Right? That's part of salvation. God forgiving our sins. And the very next thing he mentions is what? Healing. So once again, we have salvation and healing linked. Arm in arm. Salvation and healing, linked arm and arm. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5 says, 
But he was wounded for our transgressions. Who's this talking about? Who's it talking about? That's all right. You can talk to me. Go ahead. Who's it talking about? Jesus. Thank you. But he was wounded for our transgressions. What are transgressions? Sins. He was bruised for our iniquity. What is iniquity? What's that talking about? Salvation. Salvation. He was bruised for our transgression. Excuse me. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Once again, we have salvation and healing linked arm in arm. Talked about as if they were the same thing or very, very close to the same thing. And Peter quoted this verse in, in uh, Isaiah 53 when he said in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness by whose stri- uh, stripes we, ye were healed. So once again, Peter links salvation and divine healing. You're beginning to see how those two things are, are so closely aligned in the Word of God? Salvation and divine healing. Jesus died on the cross for our salvation. He also died on the cross for our healing. He also died on the cross for our healing. Mark chapter 16 Verses 17 and 18. So we've read a lot of Old Testament scripture. Let's look at the New Testament. Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. Jesus talking to his disciples after his his resurrection and just before his ascension. And these signs shall follow them that believe. What is that? Who are the ones that believe? Those who have been saved, baptized, repented, been baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay? Okay. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And they, if any deadly thing, uh, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Once again, salvation and healing are linked. And then lastly, in James chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, James says, Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? What sickness? What do you want when you're sick? Healing. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. The prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. Now listen to this. And if he have committed sin, they shall be forgiven him. You talk about a link between healing and salvation. It says if God heals somebody, he also at the same time forgives their sin. I didn't say that. That's what the Word of God said. God forgives their sins when He heals them. You see how these two things are linked? You see how these two things are linked arm in arm? So let me ask you a question. Where did sickness come from? Where did sickness come from? When God made Adam and Eve, they were perfect. There was no sickness. There was no death. There was no disease. We don't know how long they lived in the garden without being sick, without growing old. But there was no sickness. There was no colds. There was was no flu. There was no cancer. There was no, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, asthma. There was no allergies. They could go up to any of those kittens, those lions, or those little tabbies, 
And they weren't allergic to anything. They weren't allergic to, to, you know, they didn't have hay fever. There was no sickness in the garden. Nothing to, to uh, encumber their worship and praise of God. Nothing. But when they sinned, what happened? God is just. And God told them that if they ate of the tree, they were going to surely die. They didn't die that day. But when they left the garden, the death process started in their lives. And what happened during that death process? Sickness entered in to their lives. Now, people can die of other things besides sickness. You can get hit by a car and not be sick and die. You know, you can fall off a cliff and not be sick and die. So there's other ways to die, but a lot of people die of sickness. A lot of people die of sickness. And so when God created mankind, he created them perfect. But when mankind was removed from the Garden of Eden, when mankind was removed from the Garden of Eden, they were removed from perfect health. And sickness became a general rule in the human population. So what can we say is the source of sickness? What? Say it again. Say it louder. Sin. Sin is the source of sickness. Sin. The sin that we do is the source of sickness. Again, it's not the source of being killed by a car. It's not the source of being, you know, if you fall off a cliff and fall 100 yards, you're, you're going to die. And that's not, that's not the source of that. But, but sickness in your body, the source of sickness in your body is sin. And what did Jesus do? He took care of the sin problem. Right? He dealt with sin on the cross. He took our sin upon himself. And he dealt with it. Therefore, if he dealt with sin, if the atonement that Jesus did was, was, was good enough to deal with the sin in our lives, and sin is the cause of all disease, when he died, he also dealt with the disease in our life. Amen. Amen. He did. It's a done thing. By his stripes, we were healed. In Isaiah, it says, you are healed. Future, because Christ hadn't died. But in Peter, it says, we were healed because Christ died after when, when Peter came along. Christ had already died. So the, the, the future tense in Isaiah and the past tense in, in uh, Peter tells us we're talking about the cross that dealt with illness and disease. So when Jesus died on the cross, he took care of of the sin problem. I'm going to read some scriptures that I've already read. I'm going to read them again. Psalms chapter 103, verse 3. Whosoever, or excuse me, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, sin, and who healeth all thy diseases. He dealt with both of them on the cross. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity and the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Matthew chapter 8, verse 16 and 17. When the even was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed of, with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all that were sick. He healed all that were sick. He healed all. All that were sick. He healed all that were sick. 
There wasn't one disease that came in front of Jesus that he couldn't heal. In fact, he healed the ultimate disease, death. But he healed all their diseases. He healed all that were sick. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah, as the prophet saying, himself took our infirmities or our sins and bear our sicknesses. Infirmities, salvation, and sicknesses are linked. Are linked. So the atonement of Jesus Christ on the cross, the blood that was shed by Jesus Christ, not only took care of the sin problem, it takes care of the sickness problem. It takes care of the affliction problem. It takes care of the disease problem. So what can we take away from what these scriptures have told us? If you can believe for salvation, how many here believe for salvation? If you've been baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, you have believed for salvation. You have done the fundamental things that God requires for salvation. If you can believe for salvation, you can believe the same thing for your healing. Because they are linked. Amen. They are linked. Jesus died on the cross just as much for your healing as he did for your salvation. Amen. And so many times we, we, we think, well, you know, I don't know if God wants, you know, if it's for me. It's for you. It's for you. Healing is available to you. Healing is available to you. And I want to tell you something else. Healing is available to everybody. How can you say that, Brother Vogler? Who does God want to save? Which group of people do not qualify for the salvation of Jesus Christ? Who is it that is excluded from, from uh, God's plan of salvation? You don't say that with much confidence. Nobody, nobody, the, the poorest bum, the richest billionaire, it doesn't make any difference if you have an education, it doesn't make any difference if you live on the street or if you live in a mansion, it doesn't make any difference if you were high born or low born, it doesn't make any difference if you were born in you know, the north, the south, the east or the west, none of that makes any difference to God. None of that makes any difference to God. It doesn't make any difference if you've murdered a hundred people. Amen. Doesn't make any difference. God is able to forgive everybody. Amen. And it is God's will that all should come to repentance. Amen. That is the will of God. If you ever look at somebody and wonder if God wants to save them, remember that scripture. God wants to save everybody. It is not the will of God that any should perish, but that all men come to repentance. And that includes you ladies. All right? All of mankind come to repentance. So the ordinance or the uh, uh, divine healing is available to everyone, both saint and sinner. All right? Divine healing is available to everybody. Now, I've already read one scripture where it says Jesus healed them all. I count uh, four times in the Gospels where it tells us, on four different occasions, where it tells us that Jesus healed every single sick person that came to him on four separate occasions. All right? And then he passed that, he charged his disciples with that same ability, with that same commandment. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 1, this is just the first verse of an entire chapter that is the charge that Jesus gives the disciples before they go out two by two. And he says, and when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now, all doesn't mean some. 
All being interpreted here means all. It means 100%. Doesn't mean 99.9. Doesn't mean, oh God, you can't heal me. I've got the one disease that you can't heal. No, it says that he gave them power over evil spirits and all sickness and all disease. And when they came back, they were all excited because, because they were able to do the things that Jesus had charged them to do. They were all excited that the spirits were subject to them and that people were healed. So not only did Jesus heal them all, but he gave this power to his disciples. And then in Mark chapter 16, I've already read this, but I'm going to read it again. Unto, and these signs shall follow them that believe. Do you believe? Yes. If you believe, raise your hand. If you believe, raise your hand. Amen. Amen. All them that believe, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So not only did Jesus heal them all, he gave the disciples the power to heal them all, the commission to heal them all, and he commissioned all future believers that they would be able to lay hands on the sick and they would recover. Amen. Has it ever happened in the Bible other than when Jesus was there physically walking on the earth in the Gospels? Did it ever happen anywhere else where everybody was healed? Well, I'm glad you asked. Acts chapter 5 and verse 16, And there came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folk and them which were vexed with unclean spirit, and they were healed every one. Every single person that came to the disciples, came to the apostles, were healed. It's possible. The question is, do you believe? The question is not the power of God. The question is, what is your faith in? Where is your faith? Where is my faith? So yes, there was a time when everyone was healed. To enter into, a re, a, to enter into a re, an approved relationship with Jesus, we have to meet certain conditions. What are those conditions? I've already mentioned them. Repentance, somebody said faith, thank you. Repentance, baptism, being filled with the Holy Ghost. Those are the conditions we have to meet. To receive divine healing in the church, there are also certain conditions that we have to meet. Uh-oh, now you're getting into it, Brother Vogler. Now you're treading on... on on, on, on dangerous ground because you just got through spending 20 minutes telling me that salvation and divine healing are linked arm in arm. But I said at the very beginning, it was conditional. Everything in the Word of God is conditional. God's grace is unlimited and it's available to everybody, but it's conditional. You got to do it God's way. You got to come God's way. You got to allow God to lead, live, lead your life. All right? So, what are some of the conditions that you need to have to obtain divine healing? Well, the first one, the sister back here mentioned it. It's the thing that we need before we can have anything from God faith. Faith. Hebrews 11 and 6. But without faith, it is impossible. Everybody say impossible. impossible. You know what impossible means? Not possible. Very good. Not possible. You cannot please God unless you have faith. Who here wants to please God? Every hand should go up. Who here wants to please God? Thank you. We all want to please God. We all want to please God. If you want to please God, have faith. Not faith in 
you know, what's going on around you, not faith in your circumstances, not faith in your, 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 you know, your father and your mother or your bank account or, or your education or your job, not faith in any of those things. You have to have faith in God. You have to believe what God says. You have to have faith that what God says is true. And you have to trust God to, to do what he's going to do regardless of what it looks like to you. Regardless of your circumstances, you have to believe and have faith in God. I mean, you can go all through the Bible, and I don't have time to do it, but you can go all through the Bible. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. And he was asked to sacrifice his only, the, the, the promised son. And he believed God. Joseph believed God. He, was, he got a dream, and, and look what happened to him. All that he went through before he finally was able to get that dream, that, that God was able to produce that dream in him. Job had nothing. I mean, he, he was just doing his own thing. He, he didn't do anything. God didn't, God didn't want anything from him, but God used Job. God used Job as, a, as an object lesson to Satan. And, and, and Job was just living his life. All right? So we've got to believe God. We've got to trust in God, regardless of our circumstances. Regardless of our circumstances, we've got to trust God. Matthew chapter 10, oh, I've already read that. All right, so we have, to, we, have to, we have to first have faith in God. We have to first have faith in God. Remember what I said when uh, the people of Israel came out of, out of uh, Egypt and they crossed the Red Sea. I'll read it again, Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. Listen to the conditions. If thou wilt diligently hearken to my voice, and will do that which is his right, and will give ear to his command, and will keep all of his statutes. Then I'll heal you. You've got to obey God. You've got to obey God. And I started by saying, if you don't know what the word of God says, you can't obey him. If you don't know what the word of God teaches... You cannot stand up and honestly say you're obeying the word of God. If you don't know what it says, and therefore you are responsible. It's not my responsibility. It's not his responsibility. It's not her responsibility to educate you on every detail of what the word of God says. We don't have that much time. You are responsible. When you stand before God at the judgment, you have to answer for God, to answer to God. Amen. All right? Now, it's our responsibility to teach what the Word of God says. Amen. But it's your responsibility to make sure we're teaching you truth. Amen. All right? So, you have to have faith. That's the first thing you have to have. You have to have faith. James chapter 5 and verse 15. This is James teaching on prayer. Uh, excuse me, teaching on uh, healing. He says, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. The prayer of what? Faith. The prayer of faith. Who has to have the faith to be healed? Sometimes the person that you're praying for is unconscious. Right? They, 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 don't, they can't have faith or not have faith. They don't have the ability to demonstrate their faith. Amen. Right? They could be dead. Exactly. A dead person, I'm telling you right now, the dead person has no faith. All right? So, yes, if you're being prayed for, for healing, you need to have faith. But the person who's praying needs to have faith as well. The person who's praying needs to have faith as well because if the person who's praying doesn't have faith, the prayer will not be effectual. It will not, be, it will not have the ability to, uh, uh, to do what is being prayed for. So not only must the person who wants to be healed have faith, if they can, but the person who is praying needs to have faith that God is able to heal. 
Amen? Amen. So I want to talk about some hindrances to healing. There are some things that will come between you and God's ability to heal you. The first of these, I'm going to mention three. There are, there are more than this, but I'm only going to mention three. The first of these is unconfessed sin. If you are in an act of sin, if you are in an act of habitual sin, if you are doing something that is not living according to the will of God and according to the word of God, if you have a habit of lying in your life, if you have a habit of gossiping in your life, if you have a habit of stealing in your life, and you're thinking, what? What do you, what do you mention on all these things? These are all things that are mentioned in the, in the epistles that people in churches were doing. Okay? These are all things that are mentioned that people in the churches of the, of the day were doing. All right? So if you have a habit of, of uh, you know, whatever it is that is a sin and it is against the, the will and the desire of God for your life, that will hinder God's ability to heal you. And you need to come to a place of confessing that sin. And what does confessing mean? So many times we think of confession as that, you know, uh, that, that, you know, the, the, the guy sitting at the table in the, in the interrogation room and a big white light on him and, and the interrogator saying, did you steal it? Did you steal it? Okay, you got it. You got it. I stole it. You got all the evidence. I'm sorry. I, 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 got, I got caught. And, and they confess, right? They confess their guilt. Not because they feel sorry for it but because they got caught. Well, that's not the confession that we're talking about here. Because God could, could gotcha anytime he wanted to. He could do the gotcha game anytime he wanted to. But he doesn't want to do the gotcha game. He's trying everything he can not to, not to get you in a position where he's got to do the gotcha game. So what is confession in God's definition? Confession by God's definition is saying the word of God says this about the thing that I am doing. The word of God says that gossiping is a sin. And I confess that I have been gossiping. And I confess and I agree with the word of God. That's what, the word, that's what confession means in the Bible. Agreeing with the word of God. I agree with the word of God that what I am doing is is sin, and I'm going to do everything in my power to stop doing that by the grace of God. Forgive me for doing the thing that is in your word that is sin, and help me from now on not to do that thing anymore. Amen. It is not gotcha. It is I say, I see, and I confess the word of God. I confess the word of God. So when I confess my sin to God, I don't have to tell you about it. I don't have to tell him about it. I confess my sin to God. And I ask for forgiveness of that sin. And God forgives me. And, and I'll, be, I'll be the first to put my hand up for this. This is a hard thing for me to understand. How God can forgive me like that. God forgives me instantly for what I confess. Instantly. Instantly. And when I fall the next time, he forgives me instantly again. And I think, I just scratch my head at that. But that's my God. That's what he's able to do. That's what he's willing to do. That's why he died on the cross. So that I can confess my sin and, and he will forgive me. So I need to make sure that there are no unconfessed sins in my life. Uh, James chapter 5 and verse 16 says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. So we're supposed to confess our sins one to another. 
If you feel comfortable with that, that's fine. Pray one for another that ye may be healed. If you don't confess your sins, you are leaving an opportunity for God not to heal you. Second thing, the spirit of unforgiveness. If you have an unforgiving spirit, you're in a very dangerous place. Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount, he taught the, the uh, Lord's Prayer, our Father which art in heaven, we all know the Lord's Prayer. And, and he made one, one commentary comment on the Lord's Prayer. And he didn't, he didn't pick praise, and he didn't pick, pick the kingdom, and he didn't pick the will of God, and he didn't pick, he didn't pick daily bread. He didn't pick any of those things to, to make a comment about the, the uh, Lord's Prayer. The part that he thought was so important that he had to make mention, he had to make a, a commentary, if you will, on that prayer was about forgiveness. And he said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. If you have an unforgiving spirit, you are literally in the, in, in, in the way of hell. Because God will not forgive you. That's what Jesus said. God will not forgive you. But Brother Vogler, you don't know what that person did to me. I don't care. I don't care what that person did to you. Jesus said, you have got to forgive them. But I can't forgive them. Then you can't go to heaven. Now that's pretty plain. Sorry. But that's what the Bible says. If you can't forgive them, go out and live it up because you're going to hell anyway. I don't want to go to hell. I don't think there's anything that anybody can do to me that would interfere with me going to heaven that I can't say I forgive you for. And so if you have something in your heart if you have some unforgiveness of somebody in your heart, I don't care if that person's dead. You've got to deal with it. You have got to deal with it because you cannot go to heaven with an unforgiving spirit. Mark chapter 11, verse 25 says, And, and when ye stand praying, forgive, for if ye have aught against any, uh, excuse me, and when you stand praying, forgive, if ye have aught against any, that your Father also, which is in heaven, may forgive you your trespasses. You have got to get over whatever it is they did to you. You have got to say, I forgive you. I'll tell you something. When you have an unforgiving spirit, you put somebody in jail. You put somebody in prison. And it's not the person that you have an unforgiving spirit against. It is yourself. You put yourself in prison when you refuse to forgive someone for something they have done to you. And you have the key to the door that you are locked, the cell that you are locked up in. But if you refuse to forgive them, you will never get out of prison. And you will not go to heaven because God will not forgive your sins. He won't. The Bible says he won't. And this will hinder your healing. This will hinder your healing. Unforgiven or unconfessed sins, an unforgiving spirit. And lastly, you can ask God, is there hindrances to healing? You can ask God for something with the wrong motive and hinder 
his ability to heal you. James chapter 4, verse 3 says, Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your own lusts. What are you praying for? Do all of your prayers concern you and what you want and what you want God to do for you in your life? The things that you want God to fix, the things that you're not happy about in your life, the stuff that you want to upgrade that you're not happy with, are those, is that what consumes your prayer? Then I'm sorry to say that you qualify for James chapter 4 and verse 3. You are asking amiss. You want to do it just to consume it upon your own lust. And God will not heal you because of that. It's a hindrance. It's a hindrance. I could go off on that, but I won't. I want to ask a question. Does God always heal? I got a yes. Anybody else? I got some no's. It's an interesting question, isn't it? I've already read you several scriptures, or told you about several scriptures where God healed everybody. Jesus healed everybody. So, if you are in the ministry for any length of time, you're going to get this question asked of you. Why hasn't God healed me? Why hasn't God healed me? And you can go back through these three things that I've already mentioned. Unconfessed sin, unforgiving spirit, praying with the wrong motive. All those things are hindrance to healing. But there are other reasons why God may not heal a person. First of all, God is not obligated to heal you. We talked about the fact that salvation and healing is linked arm in arm. God has... Jesus died for your salvation and Jesus died for your healing, but he's not obligated to heal you. All right? Does God heal everybody? No. I'm going to talk about three types of sicknesses that the Bible talks about. First of all, there's a sickness unto death. Psalms chapter 90 and verse 10. The days of our years are three score years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet if their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27. And as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. There's going to come a time when you're going to die. It's just the way things are. God's told us. We all have an appointment with death. Unless he comes and resurrects or or raptures the church, you're going to die. I'm going to die. It's part of living. We were all born. We're all going to die. All right? So there is a sickness unto death that God's not going to heal because he plans for you to die. It's appointed unto you. To die. Now, not everybody dies of sickness, but a lot of people do. And it is appointed unto them to die. We've had a lot of people die of this coronavirus. And everybody shouts about, God is so unjust because all these people have died and he could take this virus. Hey, we have a lot of people that die from from, uh, flu every year. Not as many, I grant you. Not as many. We have a lot of people that die in car accidents. And we, nobody yells about God being unjust about that. We have a lot of people that die of, of heart attacks every year. And nobody says that God is unjust about that. So why is this a special case? God knows what's going on. God knows what's going on. He knows when you're going to die. He knows if you're going to die of this pandemic or something else. He has an appointment for you. It's on his calendar. He's already there waiting for you. He's already there waiting for you. So you've already got an appointment. It just isn't on your calendar. All right? 
And so we all are going to die of something. So some people get sick to die. And that's God's will. And we want to, oh, God, why did you let my loved one die? Because we all die. It's the way it is. 2 Kings chapter 13 and verse 14. This is about the most explicit you're going to get about this kind of thing. Now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness whereof he died. So God wasn't going to heal him. He had fallen sick. God had basically told him, you're dead. You're going to die. I'm not healing you. You're going to die. Now, there was another, there was another king, and I, and I wish I would have put these scriptures in there. I just thought of it. The, 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 uh, the prophet went to the king. The king was one of the greatest kings since David. He cleansed the land. He did all kinds of amazing things. He, he, he rebuilt the temple, not rebuilt the temple, but he cleansed the temple of all the idols. And he was doing amazing work in, in, in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Israel. And God said, okay, the prophet, go tell him he's going to die. And the king got mad. And he says, it turned, he turned his face to the wall and he cried unto God and he says, I don't want to die. And God said, okay, I won't, I won't let you die. I'll give you 15 more years. And the prophet came back and told the king, hey, you got 15 more years. Congratulations. God heard your prayers. And we all think, praise God. That's such an awesome prayer. God is so awesome. But look what happened to the king. He's the one who gave the Babylonians the keys to the armory of Israel. He's the one who in those 15 years totally betrayed the nation that he had done so much good for. He became one of the worst kings in those last 15 years that Israel ever had because he would not accept the will of God in his life to die. So don't think that because you pray and God answers your prayer and your prayer is selfish and your prayer is about you and not about the will of God, that anything good is going to come of it. This goes back to that scripture I read in James. That ye, ye, ye ask and ye receive not because ye ask amiss. That ye consume it upon your own lust. In this case, he asked and he received it. And it turned out horribly for him and the nation of Israel. So, there is a sickness unto death. When God takes the time, when God brings you to the sickness unto death, accept it. Accept it. I read an article, I, I get this thing, uh, this Pentecostal life, I think it's called, from, the, from headquarters, and I read this article, this, this old man, he got the Holy Ghost, and he was so excited about getting the Holy Ghost, and he was telling everybody, and, and, and about three months later, he got sick, and the doctors told him he only had about two weeks to die, until he was going to die. And he went around to everybody. He went, first person he told was his pastor, and he said, Pastor, I'm going to die in two weeks. Don't tell everybody. Don't pray for me. Don't pray for me to live. Don't pray for me to get healed. Because I get to go see Jesus. I want to go see Jesus. And he told the church, don't pray for me. I don't want to be healed. I get to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to go see Jesus. He was excited about dying and going on to see Jesus. And sure enough, in two weeks, he died. And they had a celebration at his funeral because that's what he wanted. We are so ensconced in this world. Don't you understand that this world is not what God wants you to be preparing for. It's the next world that we are supposed to be preparing for. This is not our home. We are just passing through. This is not where we're going to live for eternity. We are just here to learn how to hear the voice of God and walk according to his will. So when we get to the other side, we will be prepared to do that. So there is a sickness unto death. Accept it. 
and let God do what he wants in your life. There is a sickness unto God's glory. Jesus' disciples asked him one time why this man was blind. Was it because he sinned or his parents? John chapter 9 and verse 1 through 3, it says, And as Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. Now, this man was blind from his birth. He was born blind. Did he sin? How could a baby who was born blind sin? How could a baby in the womb sin? And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents? Wait a minute. You think the man sinned before he was born? But that's the question they asked. Or his parents, that he was born blind. Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents. Listen, listen now. But that the works of God should be made manifest in him. God said, when this man was born, I have got a plan for you, young man. You get to be born and you're going to be blind. That is my will for you. What? What? You get to be born blind. Aren't you happy? No, I'm not happy. No, but what did Jesus say? He said, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Amen. And this man, however old he was, he was blind his whole life. So that one day, a man named Jesus Christ could walk by him and his disciples could say, Jesus why is this man blind? Did he sin or did his parents sin? And Jesus could say, no, he's not born blind because of that. He's born blind so that God can receive glory. And somebody remembered that and put it in the Bible. And we know about it because the man was born blind as a blessing from God to you. The man was born blind so that you could hear the story and praise God. The man was born blind so that you could know that there are going to be times and circumstances in your life when God will allow things that seem to be negative to you and through you and for you, but it is to the glory and, and praise and adoration of him. That's why the man was born blind. So that you would know that it is possible for you to go through negative circumstances and God can get praise and glory from it. That's why the man was born blind. God, why is it that I have this financial trouble? I don't get it. I, I, I pay my tithes. Why, why, God, am I having this trouble? Why, God, is, is my wife being so mean to me? I try and do what the Word says. Why, God, is, are you making this? Why, God, am I having such a problem with my kids? Why, God, why... Sometimes God allows these things into our lives so he can receive glory when he fixes them. Why am I sick, God? Why, why am I sick, God? What, why, is this, why is this chest pressure? What's going on? I feel like I'm having a heart attack. Look, is God in control? Either God is in control or he's not. Either God is in control or he's not. If God is in control, you've got to trust him. If God's not in control, you're out of control. But if God's in control, you've got to trust him. I've got to trust him. I've got to seek first the kingdom of God. That's what the Bible tells me to do. And all these other things will be added unto me. So... So there is a sickness unto the glory of God. There is an illness that God may bring upon you so that he can receive 
glory through it. Amen. Amen. Now let me ask you a question. If that's the kind of sickness that God has brought onto your life, do you want the pastor to pray it off? Do you want the pastor to pray so fervently that God lifts the sickness that's going to bring God glory? I hear silence. Nobody wants to be sick. Nobody wants to be sick. Nobody wants to be at death's door. Nobody. Nobody wants to be sick. But if it's God's will, and we ask that God's will be interrupted, God will answer that prayer. But woe be it to the person that asks that prayer to interrupt the will of God. So there is a sickness to God's glory. Jesus had a friend. His name was Lazarus. Lazarus and Joseph, two of my favorite people in the Bible. Neither of them, there's not a word recorded that either of them said, but both of them were powerful men of God. God trusted Lazarus to do one thing. Do you know what that one thing was? God trusted Lazarus to die. God trusted Lazarus to die. John chapter 11, verse 3. Therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. Then Jesus heard that. He said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Wait a minute, Jesus. We read the end of the story. He died. How can you say it's not unto death? He died. There's a contradiction in the Bible. He died. It says just a couple verses later, he's dead. But Jesus said he didn't, his sickness not unto death. How do, you, how do you reconcile that? Well, Jesus here was talking as God. And when, G, when God talks, he sees the end from the beginning. He knew that Lazarus was going to die, but he also knew that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. And he was looking past Lazarus' death. He was looking to his resurrection when he said, this sickness is not unto death. That doesn't mean that Lazarus would never die. Because Lazarus did die eventually. Because he's not walking on the earth anymore. All right? But this sickness, this sickness is not unto death because I know what I'm going to do. But this sickness is for the glory of God. Verses 14 and 15, Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. What? Your friend, the one that you love, is dead, and you're glad that you, didn't, you weren't there to help him? Why? To the intent ye may believe, nevertheless let us go unto him. I'm glad I wasn't there so that it will build your faith. I'm glad I wasn't there because it's going to build your faith. Jesus didn't speak the word. He didn't go to Lazarus. And I don't, I don't think there was, a, there was a long distance between where Jesus was. You know, it may have only been a couple of miles from where Jesus was to where Lazarus was. It may not have been very far. But he waited four days. He made sure Lazarus was dead before he went. He could have spoke the word and said, Lazarus, be healed. And, and the Spirit of God would have done it. Lazarus would have been healed. Jesus didn't need to go to Lazarus. He didn't need to be there. He could have been like the centurion. The Roman centurion says, you don't need to come to my house. Just speak the word. Amen. Jesus didn't speak the word. He waited for Lazarus to die. Why? So that the glory of God could be revealed. And it can be said, it can be said that because Lazarus died and because Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, the Pharisees took it upon themselves to crucify Jesus. It was the last straw. 
If you read it, you'll find out that it was at that point that the Pharisee says, we've got to do something about this guy. We have got to get rid of this guy. We have got to do something. God trusted Lazarus to die. Could God trust you to die? Could your family be trusted to let you die? Mary and Martha had no control. Sometime, sometimes God wants to do things in our lives that are uncomfortable for us. How well do we trust God? How well do we trust God? I got other scriptures here, but I'm not going to read them. My time's quickly slipping away. And then there's a sickness unto chastisement. So we are all, what? Sons of God. We are all sons of God. And what do fathers do? What, what do mothers do? When something happens and, you know, the, the, the child gets in trouble or whatever, what do mothers do? Oh, come on, that's fine. We'll, we'll get it. You know, mothers are nurturers. Mothers are nurturers. They're huggers. They're the ones who give the love. Fathers do what? We're the discipliners. Get up. You're not hurt. Come on. You just fell down. You sneezed a little skin. Come on, be a man. Get up. My wife is, ooh. I said, come on, just leave him alone. He'll be fine. Yeah, you, you think I'm lying. That's exactly how I was. I won't tell you that story. Okay. <laughs> but, but we sometimes God has to chastise us. Amen. 1 Corinthians 11, chapter 28, 30 through 32 says, But let a man examine... Oh, I'm not going to read that. Read that yourself. 1 Corinthians 11, 28 through 32. I'm going to read Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 through 13. It says, And ye have forgotten... The exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastising of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Now, I can spank my kids. I can put my kids in time out. I can do lots of kinds of things to chastise or rebuke or, or discipline my child. God has a whole different arsenal of things he can do. One of those things he could do is sickness. I don't have that option. I can't make my child sick. I mean, I probably could, but it's against the law. You know what I mean? And I'm not going to do that. Uh, that's not what we do. But God has that option. He can make me sick as a form of chastisement. Verse number six, for whom the Lord loveth. Do you believe God loves you? Yes. How much do you think he loves you? Enough to chastise you. For whom he loveth, he chastiseth. And scourgeth. Ooh, that sounds serious. Every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastising, God dwelleth with you uh, as a, with sons. For what son is he whom the father chastiseth not? If you haven't been chastised by God, are you sure you're saved? Because God is going to chastise the sons. And all you women, you're sons. All you men, you're part of the bride. All you women, you're sons. All right? But if ye be without chastisement, wherewith all are partakers, all are partakers of chastisement, then ye are bastards and not sons. If God is not disciplining you from time to time for whatever it is, and there is always something to discipline you for. Because you're flesh. And you've got to grow. And so there is always something for God to teach you. God is always trying to grow you and mature you. And if you're not being chastised from time to time, then you're not a son. Furthermore, we have had fathers and our flesh which corrected us. And we gave them reverence. Have you, ever, have you ever thanked your father for all the, th all the times he, he corrected you? Because he created the person you are. Hopefully he created a good person. Hopefully his correction was beneficial. Well, God's correction is beneficial because he is the perfect father. 
and we give them reverence. Shall we not much more, much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure. But he for our profit, for our profit, not physical profit, not profit of money, but spiritual profit. So that we could grow closer to him. So that we could learn what he wants to teach us. So we could be more like him. So that we can, we can make it to heaven. Uh, for, for he, for our prophet, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Do you want to be partakers of his holiness? Amen. The Bible says, be ye holy as I am holy. Sister Overton taught on this last week. It says, without holiness, you cannot see God. That sounds pretty serious. It sounds like God takes holiness serious. And by chastisement, Chastisement puts us in a place where we can be partakers of holiness. And that chastisement can be a sickness that God allows to come into our lives. And I ask the question again, do you want the pastor to pray that off of you? God's trying to do something in your life. Do you want the pastor to pray for you and have that sickness leave without it doing what it's supposed to do? If you do, God's not giving up. God's got to bring something else into your life that's going to accomplish the thing that he's trying to accomplish through the sickness. So you don't want to pray that thing off of you. I said before, and I'll say it again, this is just scratching the surface of, of healing, divine healing. We, we haven't even got into the subject in all these scriptures I've read you, all right? But I want to make one more point, and that is this. Jesus is the only one that can heal. Jesus is the only one that can heal. Pastor has said it over and over and over again. He can pray for you, but Jesus does the work. Jesus does the work. You can pray one for another, but Jesus does the work. You can pray for somebody and you can say, praise God. God healed them. That's accurate. You can pray for somebody and they get healed. And if you say, praise God, I healed them. That's not accurate. Because you can't heal anybody. You cannot heal anybody. Because I'm telling you, if you could heal somebody, you'd be making millions of dollars out there healing everybody that comes up to you for a price. You can't heal anybody. I can't heal anybody. My wife has had a heart condition. We prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. And God chose not to heal her. And this is the tw uh, eighth anniversary of her heart surgery, and she is doing great. And I praise God that God gave those doctors the ability to do what they did and go in there and replace parts of her heart. But those doctors did not heal her. God healed her. God gave those doctors knowledge. God gave those doctors ability. And it doesn't make any difference if they acknowledge God or not. I acknowledge God. And she acknowledges God. And God healed her. I was thinking back there while we were praying. I was trying to think of an example. There's a diamond in the Smithsonian. I think it's called the Hope Diamond. It's one of the largest diamonds in the world. And I don't know if you know the story. I think I'm right in telling this story, but it was, it was sent to the Smithsonian in a plain brown wrapped box by an unknown person. The biggest, one of the biggest diamonds in the world arrived at the Smithsonian in a plain wrapped box through the US mail. No insurance, no nothing. A box, they opened it, here's this gorgeous, beautiful, spectacular diamond. Now they put that diamond on display, and people flocked to the Smithsonian to see what? 
What do they go to see? The display. They go to see the box that the diamond is in. Right? They go to see the plexiglass box that holds the diamond. Right? No? That's not what they go to see. What do they go to see? They go to see the diamond. They go to see the diamond. Jesus is the diamond. We are just the plexiglass box. I have this treasure in earthen vessel. I am, I don't want to say this this way, I am just the vessel. The diamond that God has put in me, the spirit of God that he's put in me, that's what I want people to see. That's the glory that I am striving to have people see. When they see me, they want it. I want me to be transparent so they can see the treasure that is in the earthen vessel. Amen. It is the treasure that does the work, Amen. not the vessel. Yeah. They don't come to see me. When I get a phone call from my wife, that gives me some great news. I don't say, thank you, phone. I appreciate the fact that I got the news on you. Do you ever do that? You ever thank your phone? No. Who do you thank? You thank the person who gave you the news, right? I am just the phone. I should not expect any praise. I should not expect any reverence. I should not expect any credit. It is Jesus that does the work. I should divert all credit to him. He's the diamond. He's the one that does the work. He's the one who deserves the praise. And when I accept the praise for something that Jesus did, I am usurping God's glory. And God is not happy with that. I have a bad motive at that point. So I want to close tonight by telling you that Jesus is the healer. Jesus is the healer. You can't heal anybody. I don't care if you're the greatest surgeon in the world. You can't heal anybody. God can use you to heal somebody. But God is the healer. And only God can heal. Only God can heal. Only Jesus can heal. Amen. And we have got to give all glory and all honor Amen. and all praise to him. Because he is the diamond. I am just the thing that the diamond is held in. And I want people to see the diamond. Let's stand. Lord, we thank you tonight for your word. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that it is part of your word that you have prepared and you have given us the opportunity to be healed, Lord Jesus, that it is, it is linked arm in arm with salvation, Lord Jesus. Lord, I pray tonight, Lord, that you would give us faith for healing and that you would give us wisdom when we pray Lord, not to pray the things that you're trying to do in our lives off of us. Lord, that your will can be accomplished in us, that your will can be accomplished through us. Lord, if we pray for anybody and they receive their healing, Lord, we need to praise and glorify you as the healer and not take any credit at all for it, Lord Jesus. Not accept any praise, not accept any thanks, Lord, but it is you and you alone that heal. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name that this word go forth and find a, a, a good place, a good ground to settle in, Lord. I pray that your people, Lord, would go back and study about divine healing and, and get into it a little bit more, Lord Jesus, and learn about how this works and what it means in our lives. Lord, I pray, Lord, that you would touch everyone that's listening to us online, either tonight or that will hear this 
in, uh, in archives sometime in the future, Lord. I pray your will be done in every single life. Give us wisdom. Give us understanding. Help us, Lord Jesus, to understand the mysteries, Lord, that you've given and revealed to us, Lord. In Jesus' name, we give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 God bless you in Jesus' name. Sunday morning at what? 11 o'clock. Be here. All those of you watching online, be here. 11 o'clock Sunday morning. God bless you in Jesus' name.